Yep, it's going. Oh, fantastic. Well, Jeff Thomas, I'm really happy that you're here with us at RHB. I um, have one question for you to start. What is the gospel and why is it so important? You've written some books on it. Mm. Why did we need another mm. gospel tract from Jeff Thomas? Mm. Mm. Oh, well, there would be many answers to that question. One would be the enormous ignorance that there is everywhere about uh, Christianity, about Jesus Christ is a swear word to many people. You, you can't go to him and this ignorant little boy and say, believe on Jesus. He doesn't know who mm. Jesus is. Mm -hmm. So we need um, tracks that have information. And then we need um, literature which explains who is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And linking him to Moses and the prophets, mm. uh, the preparatory mm. revelation, and then the apostolic interpretation that the Spirit of Christ in them gave to who Jesus is and, and what he did, and that he's the Son of God. Mm. And uh, that, that's the great question. Um, who is Jesus Christ? He's the Son of God and my Savior. Mm. And then you're my brother, or you're my sister, when you can say that. And all our literature then is whether we are going through um, historically how people in centuries before we, we, we are pygmies that stand on the shoulders of the men of the past who uh, transformed continents mm. by translating the Bible into the language of the people and by proclaiming it and purifying and reforming the church and establishing in communities all over the world, mm. um, a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is loved and spoken of well. And so um, there are many ways in which you, you come to him. You come to him um, because you're ignorant and you need knowledge and information. You come to him because of guilt and shame and uh, you need forgiveness and pardon to be to be right with God. Mm. You come to him as weak, and uh, then you need empowerment to live uh, a, a righteous and a holy and a happy life, which is uh, you are enabled to do by, by the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so mm. um, these are uh, approaches then, absolutely essential, um, and that the word that you give in booklets and books is enhanced by a life that is sh being shaped and molded and transfigured by the influence of uh, of an indwelling saviour mm. and the illimitable access every Christian has to uh, an indwelling Lord. So um, th that would be my um, approach to the gospel and the need of Christian living and Christian teaching and Christian reading that mm -hmm. it engenders and encourages. So Jeff, um, I remember meeting you for the first time in Aberystwyth, Wales, when you gave a, ex well, an extended interview actually for the revival documentary, which at the time I was doing the cinematography on, and it was Dan Pugh and I I don't think David Woolen was out for that trip, or was he? Maybe he was there with us, but Jeremy Walker was there, I think. Yes. Well, at any rate, you were there and I was there, and Dan was there. And I just was struck by the lucidity with which you talked about revival and the history of revival, in particular in Wales, which for those listening, you can watch that interview with Jeff and the extended interview in the documentary. But what I want to talk with you about right now is the current Asbury revival, as we're hearing about it, that's also been spreading out to other universities. And without necessarily giving a judgment on whether that's legitimate revival or not, what I wanted to ask you is, if you were there, 
what would you be saying to the, the students? How would you maybe, as a pastor your whole life, how would you be encouraging them, counseling them, ministering to them in the midst of this phenomenon, which, again, without placing judgment, how could you minister to individuals in yeah. that movement? I'd go as uh, they've gone into it with a, a, a measure of presupposition or remembrances of former occasions mm. in Asbury and elsewhere. Yes. When uh, there was a, a, um, a turning to the whole realm of uh, the divine and the supernatural and the spiritual and uh, an acknowledgement that um, the stuff of this world is not the only reality, but that uh, there is a dimension which is uh, ignored and opposed by so many. And uh, there had been in the past times when uh, young men and women then were stirred and uh, in certain structures responded um, as they did by prolonged times of, of, of prayer and praise and listening to the Word of God. And uh, I would be as patient as I could be and as understanding and also as enlightened as I could be too um, because um, I would want to know what teaching, what interpretation to the experience they had received or they were telling one another the Asbury Seminary is a Wesleyan based and it has a confession of faith and its fifth point is a confession about uh, receiving the Holy Spirit as a, a second act uh, by which you become sanctified and then it tries to explain that that does not mean you are wholly free from sin and you still sin but that in some way you have been upgraded, you've gone up a gear in the Christian life. And it's rather vague and it's rather dissatisfying from a biblical perspective mm. because in a sense it, it is downgrading the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And that's uh, always one of the dangers when you're talking about the necessity of a second work of grace. Mm. Because justification doesn't need upgrading and adoption into the family of God doesn't need up upgrading, God supplying all our needs. That doesn't need uh, upgrading, God working all things together for our good. He does that for the mere believer, for the converted person. And there is a definitive once-for-all work of sanctification, of being set apart to God and an appreciation of what regeneration does. It makes you a child of God. You um, come under uh, divine provision, divine protection, divine pedagogy, God caring and loving, and every Christian has that from God. And so um, you could be very careful to say there was inadequacy mm. in um, the work of the Spirit of God that gives us a new birth and creates um, all, all these things. Immediately you are a son of God. Immediately you are under the loving operations. So there was no inadequacy or failure on God's part when he, when he redeemed us. Mm, there's, no, there's no partial adoption. No. You're either a child of God or you're yeah. not. Yeah. 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 You're yeah. not ninety percent regenerate. And yeah. You have to do something in order then for the ten percent to be compensated. Mm. And that's obviously not not the case. Mm. But the the desire, the experiential dimension is very important. 
And um, as long as that isn't believed to have come because of the prolonged nature of meetings or because of um, the, the the singing um, mm. or because of um, the tingle factor yeah. that uh, the hairs on the back of your neck uh, and you seem to lose the power to stand and you have to fall and mm. um, I, I would be alarmed if people believed they had been upgraded mm. um, because of those things but if they had yeah. a new understanding of Jesus Christ mm. and realised how great and real Father, Son and Holy Spirit was and how beautiful the righteous life is and they were getting new authority to resist temptation um, the lusts of the mind and the lusts of the flesh then that, well, that would be wonderful and I would think in the the initial days of the Asbury revival some really fine work was done in that way but then um, the continuance of it mm. um, and the inevitable end of this um, it, that, that would be the searching time um, the parable of the sower tells us exactly this is what happens isn't it some falls into stony ground and there are scoffers who come and watch it and just dismiss it all and dismiss Christianity and are not persuaded and then mm -hmm. there are those that f fall with weeds and the weeds and the seed grow up together and finally the weeds strangle the seed and then um, there are uh, others then that bring forth fruit yeah, a, that's an interesting point you, you bring up about, uh, how would we say it, the the early days? Yeah. And then kind of the how the dynamic changes. Yeah. And I, I have a very good friend who is a scholar doing research uh, that just happened to coincide with this revival mm -hmm. happening and what he did he actually went down it's mm -hmm. uh his name's donald mcintyre he went down to asbury and conducted interviews with students in, right. in the library not in the chapel but in the library who'd come out of the chapel and the the overall sentiment was this thing that started as intimate and sweet and quiet and scripture driven yeah, an ex expository preaching catalyzed, I guess you could say, then got corrupted due to what he called revival tourism. And so, as you know, there were, there were these huge hours-long lines eventually outside yeah. the chapel of people wanting to get in yeah. and experience the thing that was happening. Yeah, 50,000 yeah. people driving okay. from all over the country yeah. and and then the the celebrities or so called started to arrive and the students who were initially part of that experience in the beginning were quite disappointed yeah and that's sad yeah that's sad because the lord it seemed was doing something very sweet yeah, no. yeah. and that's exactly my people impression. felt like they had to come from all over to yes, yes. to get theirs of course or they were missing out. One understands it, and it would have gone on much longer. There would have been plane loads from Brazil and Chinese people coming across, flying in to see the revival. And I think that it's a reflection of how God is working these days, that there are no great preachers hmm. like... Uh, Whitfield and Spurgeon uh, and uh, John Wesley, um, they would be swamped by the media. It, it it would be almost impossible to do it that way. And and the way it is these days is a lot of uh, God's little people, mm. and uh, um, they they're working. They they're uh, individually they're seeking to grow in grace. And then um, 
they marry in in Jesus Christ and they raise a family and they have family devotions and they teach their children and and then they go to a gospel church and they're there every Sunday they're exhorted from the word of God how they should how then we should live and he tells us and then there are fraternals of these ministers and they've gone from um, seminaries which people don't know about and where again they are trained and taught and then there are um, camps and uh, conferences again out of the public eye Washington Post New York Times knows nothing of this and they meet together in their thousands and they hear the word of God and then there are the um, magazines and then there are the websites that people go to and they learn from and all of this is the alternative culture the alternative society individually based um, personally important to millions of people but unknown by um, the media giants and uh, and that, that's uh, we're actually <laughs> doing that very thing here now this uh, uh, conversation that we're having it, mm. it'll feed into the underground culture mm. that there is which mm. the spirit of god is opening doors for and guiding and and prospering and then suddenly um a reformation heritage books will show its uh its influence by a building and by uh, the number of books it publishes and then uh, conferences will be held like the one last week in a uh, week before last in Florida where 2,000 people just gathered for a week of ministry and mm. and I was in another one um, a little smaller last week and there there the, these are the encouragements that 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 we have mm. um, and uh, around the world Zambia uh, South Korea I, I had a phone call uh, a month ago come to Westminster Chapel on uh, Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock and uh, talk to us about Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones so uh, w we get there and ah, there's no plane load of Koreans there there's a television company from Korea, one of four Christian television companies in Korea, and they're producing a program on Martin Lloyd-Jones, who he is, what his influence was. And so I'm sat down with cameras and lights, and I'm talking about how e enormously important and influential that that ministry was. And there again, then, you see this this movement, how it goes on, mm. and the impetus mm. that it has, mm. and the impact it's making. So there's so much to unpack there about uh, this underground alternative movement. Well, really, that Christianity started in that manner, didn't it? Yeah. It was not the dominant thing mm. or the popular thing. Yeah. Um, I, we could talk about that, but I, I actually want to ask you about Lloyd-Jones. Yeah. Did you know him personally? Oh, yeah, of course. And you ministered together? Or were you in other areas no, of the country? No, no. He ministered for me. He came at all. I met him and heard him for the first time in 1958, when I was just at the end of my teens and before I started college. And you remember the occasion? Before. Oh, very vividly. I'd been to camp that uh, summer and the uh, smart alecky students uh, with their cynicism, who were um, also fine Christian men, who were talking <laughs> one evening, and I was sort of hovering as a camper, listening to them, overhearing, and then they talked about the doctor. Mm. And there was a, a enormous respect, very impactful. And I just listened. I thought, oh, I must know who this person is. And then I noticed in the uh, newspaper on a the Saturday night announcing the meetings, the religious section that the people paid. There was an announcement. He was preaching at Ivan Evans' induction service in Memorial Hall. And I took the train in and walked along uh, the Cathedral Road. And I, there, you know, a full church, the men in suits, the mm -hmm. women in hats. Mm -hmm. We sang Top Lady and Watts and Wesley. And he preached. 
and gave the charge to Ivan Evans about being an ambassador. He was going to be a pharmacist, and God said, no, no, I want you to work for me. And mm. I can't remember anything. He said, I told him. I said, that was the first <laughs> time I, uh, I heard you, and I can't remember anything you said. He said, I said this. I said, I can't remember. He said, David Jones was there, and he had a great blessing in that meeting. I can't remember. I said to him, but it just... <laughs> It just impacted me with the importance mm. of preaching, which was not in word only, but power mm -hmm. and the Holy Ghost and with much assurance and impacted um, young and old. When he came and preached his last sermon in Wales and my family were there, my little girl, and after the service was over, he sat in the big seat in front of the pulpit and uh, a line of people, I had no idea who they were, were waiting to talk to him and he smiled and was delighted to see them all and they all were thanking him and talking to him and remembering some places where they'd heard him before. And, uh, and we went out, it was a warm May evening and it was light and we stood on the pavement and talked. Uh, no one wanted to go away. <laughs> we thought we might never hear him again and we never heard him again. Mm. And then my 10-year-old and I walked home together and I said to her, well, uh, what do you think of it? She said, oh, it's good. Um, it was like Sunday mornings, only simpler. <laughs> <laughs> and I made sure he heard that. I wanted to encourage him and tell him what she said, you know, that a 10-year-old found it <laughs> simple to understand. That's the blessing of God, isn't uh -huh. it? Uh -huh. So... Um, yeah, I, you know, um, I argued with him and in, in my young folly, mm. and, but I always respected him. Mm. And when I read Studies in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the first Christian books, the first Christian book I read, a boy in school gave me Parker's Fundamentalism and the Word of God. Yeah. And that, ah, I can believe the Bible. No one had ever taught me that. I can trust it. You know, hmm. It's it's the word of God. Hmm. And then um, I was given studies in the Sermon on the Mount, and oh, I loved the righteous life it described. I thought, this is beautiful. What appealed to you about it? Was it such a was it that it was such a contrast from the life you were living, or was it just your life was fine, but this was something higher, greater? What was it that I was living in the vestibule and looking and getting glimpses of what was going on when the doors opened because I, I wasn't under um, Christian biblical ministry. I was under a ministry of God is our Father and we are all brothers and sisters and that's it. Mm. But of redemption by the blood of Christ, regeneration, our ruin by the fall, um, the, these things I knew nothing, and then the righteous life, mm. and how it was. You, it, it, but the Sermon on the Mount isn't given for us to admire and think impossible, but it's given as a standard, and the energizing of the Holy Spirit enables us to attain it imperfectly, but in our desires and ambitions and in our sorrows when we fail, it's there. And the beauty of it then, the beauty of turning the other cheek and going the second mile and overcoming evil with good, um, of the beauty of uh, uh, instead of an ego, but being poor in spirit and mourning for your sin and meek and being a peacemaker and hungering, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That was that was the counterpoise to the failure of the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God without the indwelling of God the Spirit to enable mm. us. And mm. He he showed that to me. And he showed me what real preaching can do then. And so immediately the seeds of desire. My father's twin brother was a preacher, but a liberal. My father's sister married a preacher, but a liberal. Mm. His brother was a preacher, but a liberal. So my uncle dad's brother... He never preached on the the Apostle Paul, except, you know, selected verses, uh, which he gave his own interpretation to. There was an impoverishment. There was an unmasculining of him as a man. Mm. 
and when I met um, gospel Christians, I, I, I met humanity in the form of men and a woman who influenced me very much, uh, Bessie Jones, a widow who kept a shop and uh, she was just uh, a tower, a glorious example to me of the righteous life mm. and such fun to be with as well. Mm. And so, um, you know, that, that Lord Jones was opened the door and I came into that, that world. And uh, then I discovered its breadth. Its breadth was Kuiper. Um, its uh, breadth was Wilberforce. Um, its heroes were Spurgeon and Whitfield and Luther and William Tyndale. And um, the, the, the men that influenced me then, uh, men I had more access to, I. Dr. Lloyd Jones lived in London. I'm 250 miles away, and so I I don't see him. I I'm not in only once in Westminster Chapel on a Sunday to hear him, and never on a Friday night. But these men, um, you know, I could knock their door and go in and sit with them and and their wives and admire a Christian family and want a Christian wife like they had, and you know, God gave me new ambitions and new privileges. And uh, the mm. Christian life was a wonderful confirmation that these things weren't a pipe dream, but they were a reality to be obtained imperfectly, but yet attained by by grace. And uh, that was true for the 52 years I was married to my wa first wife. And now that I am 84, do you know, Next year, I will have been a Christian 70 years. I was converted in March 1954. Um, and the first years looking for fellowship, knowing there was something better, and God opening doors, and uh, God leading me to university and the Christian Union, and fellows my own age then, who uh, mm. were thinking of the ministry and being preachers. and. Uh, before that, preachers are all old men, and here were young men who were alive and fun and godly and knew the Bible and were wonderful examples to me and uh, <laughs> friends like that. So you had, move the mic a little bit closer to you. Just, yeah, that's fine. The 11th. It's 11.45? Yeah. Okay. You okay to talk for a few more minutes? Because yeah. yeah. um, there's, there's a burning question I have after what you just said. Is It sounds as though these... Your Christianity was not really much of an individual thing. It was in one respect. Mm -hmm. But you've just described the examples that you saw of the families... Around, that you were interacting mm -hmm. with as a youth, mm -hmm. then when you, get, when you get to university, how important that was. Mm -hmm. A thing like the Christian Union, mm -hmm. a peer group, mm -hmm. especially not of just other Christians, but men in particular who had a hunger for understanding Scripture, proclaiming Scripture, mm -hmm. feeling or sensing a call to the ministry. Mm -hmm. Would you say that for yourself, you pastored for a very long time, and... Um, I would say you're still involved in ministry in your way. What um, was there? Was there an immediate spark for you? Was it hearing a sermon? Was it reading a book? Or was it more of a gradual being brought to this place of being called into the ministry as as your capital V vocation that happened more in a holistic communal manner? Communal meaning yeah. seeing other saints living their lives yeah. and wanting to explain God's word to them. Yeah, that's uh, that's very very important, and it, it was the latter, I think. So it wasn't just a, a moment in time that you could pinpoint. There was. Um, it it was a it's a big thing for it. 21-year-old, 22, to say I'm going to become a preacher. 
It's, mm. it's a huge thing to open up about because one is also so trapped by the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the mind and the, the vanity of life and, uh, you, oh dear, and uh, the, the fun that you get from carnality and to, to think to be a preacher. Um, and so in my heart of hearts, I, there was only one thing I wanted. And when I had to meet some case of discipline for wrongdoing at the university, and I had to acknowledge I'd done something wrong, I said to the professors that were interviewing me, he said, I'm going to be a preacher. And I, I forget that I had said that. I'm going to be a preacher. And I'm going to ask people to repent and turn from their sins to Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to ask them to do it, then I, I've got to do mm. that myself. Mm. And so then in 1961, um, before I went to seminary, though I had a place at Westminster. Um, before then, I, I I was revealing under that little bit of pressure that that, that was there. But I didn't have a assurance to say it until I'd had a talk um, in my last semester in 64 with uh, Ed Clowney, asking him, did, did he think I was fit to be a, a minister? Mm. And he told me, he would have no hesitation to encourage me to come into his denomination and be a pastor and that I should wholeheartedly give myself to it. And uh, after that, that uh, outward confirmation by a man of God mm. to an inward state that I was, it, it was buried in, in, in me. I, I knew from then on. I never doubted, like I never doubted uh, uh, in 19, from 1954 onwards when I first became a Christian, that uh, I was a Christian, when I was behaving in the most sub-Christian of ways. I knew I was behaving like that as a believer in Jesus Christ. Mm. And uh, uh, it didn't take my assurance from me. When yeah. he said to Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you know everything. You know that I love you. He didn't say, well, I don't know the way I behave with that woman when she asked me uh, if I was with Jesus and I cursed and so on. I don't know if I am a Christian. He didn't say that. Mm. And I never said that. I wouldn't allow my sins to crush my assurance about my status as a believer or my vocation as a minister of the gospel. And I haven't, through all the failures of being a minister, um, I uh, I was failing as a man set apart by God to preach his word. Mm. It's, it goes back to what we were talking about um, when we were discussing revival. Yeah. You, adoption is forever. Yeah. God doesn't de-adopt yeah. or reject yeah. in the midst of that. And what a, what a glorious God we serve for that, mm. that truth about his his fidelity despite our mm -hmm. infidelity mm. yeah mm, it is that that is uh, that is the case and uh, you you trust that the um, true believers in Asbury amongst that student body uh, they will be discerning enough and compassionate and loving enough to so say, well, time will tell, time mm. will tell, but we'll try and help you. You, mm. you know, you can count on me. I, uh, you got a friend in me. You, you <laughs> <laughs> come and talk to me if you're struggling in the Christian faith. They can say to their their friends, and they'll pray for them. Mm. Uh, it, it'll be a experience. They must never forget. They will not forget, but they must not romanticize. Mm. Um, the Christian life is from the hard to the difficult and the difficult to the impossible. Mm. And if that isn't the logic of the Christian life for you, then you've, you've got to think again about it. It's uh, extraordinarily challenging. It is to love God with all your being. Mm. It is to totally deny yourself. And, uh, the impossible ask. Yeah. Which... Yeah. 
which should make us, which should lead to this overwhelming anticipation and yearning for Christ's return. Uh, yes, that's right. It yeah. is. That's the great event of the future, not revival. Yeah. The great event yeah. is his coming yeah. again. Because if, li- if this life isn't impossible as a Christian, then we can live our best life now and yeah, yeah, just yeah, be sure, happy, sure. pursue happiness. Sure, I challenge uh, yeah. one of my grandsons who's not a believer. Uh, are you a Christian? Ah, uh, he says. It's very difficult. But until he says to me, it's impossible. Mm, mm. Until he sees that and he must say, nothing in my hands I bring. Hmm. Naked come to thee for dress and cast himself holy on God. Have mercy on me when there's no other argument except please be merciful. Then, then he's become a Christian. Mm, have mercy, yeah. Let me close with one last question for you. You've written a, an autobiography. Mm-hmm. For those who pick this up and read it, which they should, what, what, what's the one thing you want them to walk away with having, what, what's the, the, brand, the branding on their brain mm-hmm. and their heart, mm-hmm. the impression that you want them to walk away with? Not just about you, Jeff Thomas, yeah. but you tell me, what should we think and know walking away from reading your autobiography? Well, that I was a very um, ordinary boy from an ordinary home with ordinary parents who were religious and so were slightly different from the other boys in school and uh, how God set his love on me and that um, no one reading it can say um, I'm not good enough or (laughs) I need to be something special I need to be holier, more victorious in defeating sin and so on and then I can become a Christian um, but an, an ordinary sinner who was loved by Jesus Christ and changed by him and uh, that he's kept me for uh, 70, 70 years Hmm. he's kept me and uh, he he can keep you too and uh, I hope you gain that from reading what I've written. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much Jeff for coming and talking to me. Really appreciate this. (laughs) (laughs) You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Thanks, everyone, for listening.